Um, I'm also setting my coffee down. Uh, so before I get started on the talk part of the talk and the intro part of the talk even, um, I just wanna say that uh, this slide does not refer to veterans. Um, members of our US military uh, serve uh, for our right to have a voice even when that voice is against the country that they serve and that's pretty awesome. So uh, since I'm up on stage, I just wanna say uh, thank you to our US veterans and um, you know whether they see combat or not, um, they put their lives at risk when they enlist and so thank you. I am honored to be in a community with those who have served um, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, this does refer to everybody else's butt, um, especially mine, since it's facing the goat. Um, but uh, I, this should surprise no one uh, that I have a do, I do have a little bit of a content warning, which is I will occasionally use uh, so-called curse words, um, at least on my slides at the very least. I did my grad school work in English just up the road at the University of Cincinnati. And um, so I do have a healthy respect for language and words, and I don't mean to offend anyone when I use them. Um, I just, and I hope you still get takeaways in spite of my horrible language. Um, okay, so I, I know you folks came here for some kind of a talk involving goats, but I'm gonna start with cattle, um, or, or cows, uh, as they're colloquially known, uh, whether it's uh, regardless of gender or whatever. I know all these things, it's just it, too much. Uh, so I was doing a road trip last month through Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Oregon. And in fact, I got the call about this being a keynote while in the hills of Montana. The phone actually cut out. So I'm like, I think I'm a keynoter, uh, but I, I don't know. Um, but in any case, we saw a lot of cows. And um, we'll just skip to the end. I decided I wanted to pet a cow. So I found a, an accessible field, and I got onto the field, and I discovered that these were not, these were not the lady cows for, designed for milking that I had thought that they were. Um, so there I was, surrounded by cows, with my friend filming me, and I got off the field slowly, and um, later at a diner, I did what we all do, which is Google for information about what all these cows were up to. And I found out some information that just kind of blew me away and I thought, oh good, I'm gonna be on a big stage. I get to share this with everybody. Um, and so you just, you have to hear about uh, cows. So you, you don't know what you don't know. And what I did not know, and maybe, maybe you two are in this camp, an ox is not an animal unto itself. Did you think an ox was an animal? It's not, it's, it's not, it's a role. Like any, no, no animal is born being an ox. I had no idea, I played Oregon Trail my whole life, oxen were pulling the wagon. I had no idea that an ox was not an animal. It's a role, it's a cow that is trained to be a draft animal, and by cow I mean, again, all the genders. But your, your lady dairy cow, she can be an ox, but no one's born an ox. That's just, that is just crazy to me, I had no idea. Um, so even, uh, hopefully this is news to you, and so even if the rest of this talk does not go well, you now know about that the ox is not an animal. Don't spread that rumor anymore. Um, uh, but don't worry, even if this is not news to you, I'm totally gonna use a horrible analogy uh, about this later. Um, spoiler alert, it's gonna have to do with you being able to be a cow, code cow without, you know, and you can still put, do the ox's job of being a documentarian while you are a code cow. So that's awesome. Um, but uh, frankly, I'm still pretty blown away by this information, and now you know. Okay, uh, so my name is Tara Scherner de la Fuente. You do have the empathy of a goat. And I will be talking about uh, documenting with the user in mind. Um, I am a software engineer at Roostify, which is a tech company based in San Francisco. Uh, we're making mortgage buying awesome. No, really, it's happening. I, I'm part of it. And um, I work from my home office in Portland, Oregon. By home office, I mean in my living room with my cat. And um, my Twitter handle is Media Remedial. That's back from when I did things with, more things with words. And um, I wanna point out, it's not on any of my other slides because a lot of the images and content aren't mine so I don't brand them. Um, so if you want to tweet, go wild, but um, that's, that's where it is up there, media remedial. And then speaking of animals taking on roles and that sort of thing, uh, when I'm a goat, 
I tweet at goat user stories. And um, I do have stickers that look just like that, by the way. Also roost by stickers, I put them over there for after. Um, if you aren't familiar with goat user stories, I do a traditional user story each day at 10.20 a.m. Pacific, actually. And um, it is a, um, as it, the traditional format for a user story as a user, I want to sow that, and um, my user is always a goat. And so sometimes it's serious, sometimes not, sometimes goats just have problems they need to share. So that's what that's all about. Uh, okay, so the user and documentation. Um, I'm gonna make up a statistic now. Let's say, as developers, about 80% of our job is working with text. So documentation should not be as avoidant worthy as it tends to, to be. But I mean, even with my sort of over degrees English person self, I don't wanna stop building things and solving problems uh, to do documentation. So what this talk is sort of geared toward is um, talking about good documentation that's built into our processes. So it feels less like putting on the yoke for, you know, oxen reference, um, and, uh, and just kind of building that into our dev process. Uh, so first, I wanna talk about the user. And this part is, is nothing new. The user is in the mirror. It's especially the user, you the user, three weeks from now, five weeks from now, when you no longer remember that awesome code that you built. Um, the user that I'm gonna talk about today is future us, uh, your fellow developers, those on your team, those elsewhere in your company, other developers who are using your code, managers, stakeholders, and, and clients and, and customers, but really the folks that you're usually interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, you know, the reason we have jobs. Um, so then the documentation, um, I put some examples up there. Homegirl's not gonna talk about this kind of documentation, like formal documentation. I'm homegirl in this example, by the way. I'm, I say that about myself sometimes. I forget that's not natural language. Um, but in any case, I am not going to be talking about that formal kind of documentation. Again, I'm talking about like the documentation in code, in git commits, in PRs, in um, other types of documentation that we actually run into and actually read and use on a daily basis. Um, I love this image. I send this image to my friends when they are promoted into management. And I, <laughs> you can already suspect why, but I do, I, can, I congratulate them, mazel tov, on moving into management. I'm Jewish, so I say mazel tov. And, but you can say it too, it's awesome. Um, and then I'm like, here's your box full of meetings. And, and this, is, this is how I view things. So, no matter what uh, Rubyists tell you, comments in code are not the enemy. Um, I know that's horrible to say at RubyConf, but it's true. Um, meetings are the enemy, at least in my opinion, and it's my talk, so uh, that's, that's what we're going with. Um, so good documentation is not only empathetic to the user, but it helps avoid meetings, which is my goal for you. Um, so if no one has to ask you a question about why you did something, in what way, and how the behavior changed, you get to keep coding and building the fun things, and, and that's, that's, that's the goal. So we're paid, most of us pretty well, uh, for our knowledge, experience, and ability to kind of code fast, hopefully. Writing good code at a good pace is one of the ways we earn our keep. And then another way is by commu clearly communicating what the user needs to know, and so that they can use their knowledge and do the next thing, whatever that next thing is. So if you're on a team, that's what you need to be doing, even if your team is only you and future you, which I particularly thought about yesterday during Matt's talk when he's just, it's 1993 and he's the one user, but it was also future Matt's was also on the team, and um, I have purposely resisted asking him what his documentation was like back then, because I didn't want my thesis proved incorrect before my talk. I'll ask him later. Um, but in any case, even if it's just you and future you, um, documentation is so key because it can help speed you up and keep you coding rather than explaining or under-explaining uh, when somebody needs to go. And that's the two sides of the curse of knowledge, over-explaining and under-explaining. Neither serve you well, both are gonna have you ending up in meetings, so if you assume that most of the people reading your code all know the underlying concepts and the tech details, uh, you might have the empathy of a goat, and not in a good way. 
um, let's say they can read the code and know what it does. Even the best code cannot explain why it's there and what it's doing there. If it's unusual, if it's implemented to solve something surprising, or it behaves in an unexpected way, understanding the code, being able to read it, isn't necessarily enough. And we're already users of people's documentation when we're coding. I mean, does anybody get through their day without Googling? I, I do not. Um, but um, the kind of stuff that we benefit from when building the code, that's the sort of documentation we should be contributing and what I'm hoping to encourage you to do. So if we document things, maybe we save other people time and it doesn't have to be re-documented, and maybe you save time and uh, perhaps ideally have fewer meetings. Um, so the flip side of the curse of knowledge is over-explaining, which I may have done with livestock uh, earlier, but it's too late. An overwhelming amount that no one could hope to parse out or need is one of the curses of knowledge that, that we get to, to. But it's at least a start, and I will get to like how to, get, how to recover from over-explaining uh, unless you're doing a talk. Uh, so the first thing that you have to do is find those user stories that I mentioned about the goats earlier. And while I was looking for an image for these slides to prove the actual point I made, I found all kinds of inspirational quotes on the internet. That's no surprise. Um, and this is one of the quotes, and then the image was sort of funny, even though it's blurry. Um, if you only focus on the problem, you might miss the easy solution, which sounds totally logical, right? But what if getting out of the crate is not the cat's problem, as far as it's concerned? What if you just assume that the solution is just hopping out of the crate? What if the crate's just missing a blanket, or it's trying to stay away from a mouse, or a toddler, or something? So you need to start, certainly, by identifying your user, who, again, might just be future you, but then you need to identify with the user. And, and one of the best ways to do that is to focus on the problem not the solution, just in case that was not clear. Um, so one of the most valuable things that I ever did as a developer was to watch uh, an end user. In this case, it was somebody internal to the company. And uh, what the user wanted was a solution to a CSV loading problem. Now, if you have ever worked with a CSV loading problem, you know that I could possibly solve that one, but there will be another one. And um, so focusing on the solution and what the user wants is not really going to help me very much. So I, I watched her up. It was a salesperson. I watched her upload the CSV and show me all the hell and damnation that happened afterward. And, um, and I watched her, and it just I just was sort of blown away. She was showing me all the things she had to do um, just to sort of leave out tons of details. There's like dates and times and other things on this CSV, and they're all supposed to line up to other things that are already in there. And if they're not in there, she has to use a pull-down list and find the thing and line it up. And oh, god, it was awful. Um, and so I'm looking at this, and obviously there's a CSV loading problem. And that's one of the problems I'm going to uh, deal with. But what I found is that every time there's an error, um, she has to go into this pull-down list. That sucker was not even sorted. It was not sorted. So like, there's like 50 dates, and she's there's looking for something at, on December 17th at a certain time. There's a bunch of December 17ths, and then there's other dates, and then there's more December. Oh, God, it was horrible. And then, and then she had to do it twice in each one. Somebody left an equal sign on the view page, and so the poor woman had to go in there twice and fix that. She didn't even care about that. That wasn't even the problem she cared about. Moreover, she, uh, she'd fill out all these things, and there'd be more problems on other pages. She couldn't save the one page and move on to the other page. And she didn't even consider that a problem. But those were, I could totally fix those real quick. Like, less than an hour, we'll have that pushed up. And at least when you have a CSV loading problem, which even if I fix this one, you're going to have another one, now she can save the things, and all the things are awesome. So, if you start with what they want or the solution, you could miss improving somebody's life exponentially each time something goes, goes horribly wrong. Um, so if you can watch the user, even if it's a fellow developer who's verifying that your code works as expected, that's so helpful to know not only about code design, but about what you might need to explain, either in the code or in a, or in a git commit or something to, to explain some unexpected behavior. Um, if you can ask a product manager to screencast somebody using the app that you're building, so much the better. And you'll find out what questions everybody has and find out what you need to, uh, what information you need to convey. Um, 
if you can if you can rock, if you can be one with the problems, you'll be that much more alert to empathizing with the user. And oh God, saving that poor woman from all those horrible pull downs. Oh, it was awful. Um, so um, I hesitated to bring up commenting in code to a bunch of Rubyists, but I'm going to do it. Um, it. It should be easier to grok with a coder and their pr uh, possible problems, but old code is old English. Um, and it's not right for every project, but if you've got some kind of method, say, that you're putting into your code, and maybe it's going to be short-lived, or it's relying on a particular version of active record, um, and uh, it's something that perhaps somebody could remove in the future. And this uh, particular comment, it's, it is an actual comment uh, from code, including line three, which, by the way, this was only like three lines, but I had to bump up the font and all that kind of thing. Um, God bless Sam Livingston Gray, who writes the best comments in all of development that I've ever read. Um, so he, it clearly explains why this method exists, and it tells you what exactly it's trying to accomplish and why it's trying to accomplish this. So if you come across this comment, write in code, um, and it's like, we're in Active Record 4 now or whatever, and this is no longer an issue. Maybe we can remove this method and make things work traditionally and then remove that. Maybe leaving line three, because it's funny. Um, but this is the kind of thing that you might want to document in code, because this isn't about how the method works. We can read how the method works, but why it exists in the first place and um, can easily be removed later, you're not going to think, especially I was in an app that was several years old with tons of developers in it. I'm not going to think, hey, this is an unusual method. I should look and see what the original commit said and what all the information is. Probably it's been refactored and changed over the years, and probably nobody brought, would bring the information across through all the commits. I wouldn't. I'm lazy. Um, but if it's a comment in code, it's accessible. It's right there. It's potentially short-lived if that problem uh, if that problem goes away. So these are great things to comment about in code. Um, so you want to explain the why. And now I want to talk about commit messages. And I am going to cover the rudimentary parts because why should we assume that everybody knows like some good practices? You know, if you don't have a traditional, like I do this for my commits every time, maybe you could, which is great. So you want to explain what, you want to explain why, uh, how is more like what you talk about over beers uh, later on. Um, but in a great commit message, um, you want to, again, cover what the perfect code cannot explain. And, um, and so some practical things for a commit message. Just going to cover this. I know this is review for a lot of you, but it'll be real quick. So the um, first thing right off the bat is uh, your first line of your commit message. This is going to appear in your Git log one lines. Um, and it starts with a capital letter. It does not have a period at the end. It's less than 50 characters. Skip a line. This is very important. And then explain the what and the why. Discuss anything unusual. If, um, if again, if if baby seals are going to be clubbed if something has changed, note that. That is important. It's very helpful. If there is, uh, if this is an unusual thing and you found documentation, yay, uh, about implementing it, include a link. You can include little bullet points with the, uh, with the hyphens there. If uh, you've got an issue that you can link to with a Kanban board, uh, include that. I will say, don't rely on auto magic services. Uh, if you can have a direct link to something, that's good. OK, so we're moving on from that. I know that's review for a lot of you. But a good commit message, this is part of like documenting as part of the dev process. So I, I mean, a good commit message does not take all that much time. And this text can be copied later, and, and it's awesome. So let's say you're not that ambitious. Um, one thing I didn't cover on the last one, uh, or the last slide, is the form like the tense, there's a, an official name for, I think it's like imperative or declarative or something that you're supposed to put these in. I just always think this commit will, and then what follows is, is the commit message. But you can, um, you can do git commit slash m, that's for message, and put it right in there without any explanatory stuff. It's kind of sad. Um, but that after style, that why style, I sort of think of that as a condensed user story. So if you can figure out your user, as a user, I want to do something so that like, maybe the user wasn't enabled before. So that's important. Now they can do that. Maybe they couldn't have, they couldn't use a GOAT message before. Now they can. Um, what's changed and why? That sort of encompassed. This isn't a great example. You can do better. It'll be great. Um, 
So that's the sort of thing you want to do. And then if you have done a good commit message, well, if you use GitHub and use it for PRs, it will, it will all translate up onto GitHub if you've done this well, especially that line skipping thing. It'll, it'll be up there, and then you can address it more with like, um, you know, company-specific things that uh, you do. Maybe you do some of that auto-magical stuff. Uh, at one of my last companies, we, um, we waited till we were in the PR stage to add who we paired with, which kind of documents non-driving work and, you know, gives credit to where help was given and that sort of thing. But um, so you can add some different things. And uh, again, just the whole idea is to make documentation just an automatic part of the experience. Um, so ideally, you are crafting code that is easy and obvious for the user to use, uh, but it won't be obvious to everyone. Maybe it's not, I, right now I'm at a company where we do a lot with compliance and security because it's the mortgage industry, banking industry, it's really important. So a lot of the documenting we do, we have to explain through audits what we do and why. And we have to justify the changes that we make in code. So sometimes I'm writing us for a security person or a financial person, and that's important. Uh, to consider when I'm writing these commits and these and these PRs, you have your own context and users that you're you're writing for, so it's not going to be obvious to everyone. And if you want to avoid meetings, like explaining to the security person why you made this change, document what changed and why. Comments are not the enemy. Documentation is not the enemy. Meetings, if I have not been clear, are the enemy. So you want to you want to comment where necessary and helpful, and write write a great commit message. Um, depending on what needs to be written, you may be self-conscious about some of your writing. So, um, or you may need just some practical writing tips. I have that for you. I know, you're excited. I can tell. Everybody loves this documentation. So this is an excerpt from Anne Lamott's awesome book, Bird by Bird. She does write about writing. And this is a quote from this excerpt which is almost all good writing begins with terrible first efforts. You need to start somewhere. Start by getting something, anything, down on paper. So if you're one of those over-explaining folks, at least you're getting started. And I want to reiterate that I'm talking about anything you might feel self-conscious about writing. And that includes commit messages, stack overflow answers, a lovely rake task that makes lives better, a read me. I don't care what, if, you, if you're unsure about even getting started, just write a shitty first draft, for the love of all things holy. Uh, the hard part is getting that first draft down, but the first draft writer is the unsung hero. The best writing is rewriting, we know that. So you can be the re you can let the rewriter get all the glory. You will be a hero to the rewriter if you just, you know, just put it down there. They will know how awesome you are for having a place to start. So just just take the leap and and I know I couldn't help but take the leap. There was a there's a goat. I write yeah. Anyway, uh, just don't think about starting. Just get started. And um, OK, so now some, <laughs> I was an English major, and I really, I'm not a Shakespeare fan. But practical tips for, for most of your documentation. OK, so just some practical writing tips. We can't cover it all, but write shorter sentences. Don't try to sound sophisticated. Nobody wants that shit. Avoid jargon and acronyms. And again, this goes back to having empathy for the user. Like, you're not writing only for future you. You're writing also for the people who don't understand all of the things that you're including. So if you can spell out an acronym like CI stands for lots of things. Sure, continuous integration is all very nice, but it won't always stand for continuous integration. Write that stuff out. Avoid jargon. Picture the context and the likely user, even if your mats with this there's you and future you, but later there's a million Ruby users. So let's just in, let's just imagine that he wrote documentation with us in mind. I just I'm not I haven't asked him yet, so it could be true. Um, writing is is thinking, like I, I or at least it is for me. I write myself. I as I write, I'm thinking, I'm developing an idea, and I ask specifically. I'm a member of Write the Docs, which is an organization for technical writers. Because one point I thought I wanted to be one, but this this stuff pays so much better. Um, but so, and it's so much more fun. I solve puzzles for a living. Yay! Um, but you will write your way to the main point. And I asked this organization of tech writers, like in a, in a chat, what advice I should give to a room full of developers. And here's what they said. They said, you, many of you will over explain yourselves 
all the way to the main point. Move that sucker up to the top. You don't even have to edit out the stuff that got you there. You don't have to delete it, that would be nice. But if you could just move it to the top, that's what they asked me to share with you. And that's actually what I used to sh tell my comp students. You know, They would get to the thesis. I'm like, that sucker needs to be way up here. And then you write the stuff that supports that. So please, if you write your way to the main point, move it up and edit it out if you can, and use specific examples. That's really, that's the best writing advice that, that I've got, and then here's the secret to writing, which is handy. Um, but don't let feeling not good enough stop you from writing that shitty first draft. Um, crappy first drafts are fantastic. All writing requires uh, rewriting. Be okay with writing that first one. Um, and then maybe future you can edit it, and that's gonna be awesome. You're gonna do great with that. Okay, so um, now, let me just be honest, this last section is for miscellaneous stuff I would hope to get to, some recap and stuff, and then stuff about being famous and making money if you want, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, so the best way to get good at, at um, writing is to do more of it. So some more ways to practice. Write install instructions and ask one of your fellow developers to follow those install instructions and see what you missed, find out what you missed. Offer to follow someone else's instructions and take the second draft. Remember, the second draft is awesome. Everybody loves the second draft. Do that. Um, update a readme. I, um, I signed up for, I should have put this on the slide, docsdoctor.org. Anybody do that, docsdoctor.org? Oh my God, okay. Here's what needs to happen. You go to docsdoctor.org, and this is all about all the things that are not documented out there in open source projects. Each day, and you don't have to do it this frequently or this much, they send me two pieces of code from Ruby and from Rails that are not documented. And, and just sort of suggest that, hey, I might want to be the one to do that. One day I did that, and I submitted a pull request for some with some documentation to Rails, and they said, hey, you know what? It turns out that code doesn't work like everybody thinks that code works. Um, and hey, would you like to deprecate that and then remove the code? So I'm like, oh, I'm gonna be a Rails contributor. And, and then I was, and um, if you work at Living Social, you know that I then bragged about it profusely, especially because I was in the release notes right above DHH. Oh, it was awesome. And if you think now being able to say that I am a Rails contributor didn't lead to job interviews and negotiation and salary, you are incorrect. Um, so, and that was just because I tried to do some documentation, and that's how I got my first two PRs into Rails. But if you're using this open source stuff, contribute to it. Um, and you can, they need documentation, docsdoctor.org, I'm telling you. Sign up for it, it, and there's tons of different projects you can sign up for. I just chose Ruby and Rails for reasons that should be clear, given where we are. Um, so write blog posts, save someone. How many times has a blog post saved me? Oh my goodness, it certainly has. Publish a tutorial, film, even a YouTube one where you do a screencast for something. Um, reduce costs by saving future time, figuring these things out. Give a conference talk about some horrible problem you ran into. I gave a conference talk like two years about, about this horrible strong params thing. Oh God, it was awful. Um, and I contributed to the documentation that is out there on the internet if you search for particular problems and run into. In fact, one of my problems uh, contributed to uh, the development of not by me, by uh, Andrew Hunter, I believe, at Living Social, the uh, ruby gem called Strong Like Bull. Um, and that happened because I kept screwing the pooch with my strong parameters. Uh, they kept blowing up uh, the app I was working on and people kept saying, Tara's parameters are strong like bull. Oh my gosh, it's totally tied. A bull could be an ox, just so you know. Um, I didn't even play in that. Um, but so now the gem, by the way, is called Strong Like Bull and it can help you do your strong parameters. But so documentation can lead to Ruby gems and all the things are awesome. Um, so uh, justify a salary increase by all this amazing time you've saved solving problems. So that's awesome. Um, okay, uh, some of you may recognize this. It's a little faded out, but it's kind of the loading thing for Slack. Um, I wanted to bring this up because conversational documentation is 
awesome. Um, it's, it, you don't, it, you're not trying to document anything. It's part of your dev process. You put something out in a room or something. Uh, it doesn't have to be Slack. It could be any, any kind of service like this. Here's my problem. People try to sort it out, and eventually there's a solution. If you pay for a service like Slack, you have automatically documented the problem. You pay for Slack so that you can search the archives. That's why you want to pay for Slack. If you're not doing that or paying for whatever service you use, do that. You want to be able to, that's automatic documentation. That should be an easy sell. If nobody is buying Slack yet, have convinced them this is automatic documentation. You no longer have to document whatever it was outside of it. You can just leave it in Slack and find it later. So automate those, automate those documentation steps. And then um, since I've got Slack up here, this is an actual release note from, uh, from Slack. And uh, I, I kept it because, first of all, some of your commit messages and PR messages can become release notes. But I think also it's a good reminder that your personality doesn't have to leave just because you're writing official documentation. And uh, so this is a good example uh, of that. As are Sam Livingston Gray's commit messages. Commit, uh, messages and code. I feel sad for you all that you don't get to read those because, oh, there was one about the Pope. Uh, it was great. Um, okay, so this is actually from Eric Holscher, uh, who is the head of Write the Dots, uh, again, that technical writing organization. And I'm going to quote him, so I'm going to read from this. Um, he says, if people don't know why your project exists, they won't use it. If people can't figure out how to install your code, they won't use it. If you have no users, people won't contribute to your open source project. If you have no documentation, you will have no users, and you will not get contributors. So if you are working, I know many of you are working with an open source project. Uh, if you want to make Ruby great again and be stronger together, this is from Matt, it's not any political candidate, um, then you want to contribute to the documentation for Ruby and, and build this community. And um, so then if you are the first to document something, like, like the crazy strong pram so something, although that didn't really lead to fame and fortune like I'd hoped. Um, but if you are the first to document something and it becomes useful, it could become widely used. You could become famous if that's kind of your thing. Uh, you could co-write a book about something related to this. You could write your own book just on your own. Neil, you've written books. Talk to the people. Tell them how to write a book later. Not, not right now. Um, you could tweet about Oxen or something, and, and Ox, Ox user stories, totally available. You could, you could be doing this. Um, so there's all kinds of ways to use your writing to elevate your career or whatever the heck you're doing. Look at this goat. Oh, I love, I love goats. So a quick recap. Uh, focus on the problem. Figure out what the user needs, not what they want. Write the shitty first draft. Explain the why, move the main point to the top. For all things holy, move the main point to the top. Uh, future you might be uh, the user, so be good to yourselves, and, and grok your user uh, as a goat. So uh, that's all I have, other than stickers and information about Roostify over there. So thank you very much for your time and attention for documentation. I'm not sorry that I suggested comments in code. It's, it's good for you. Um, if you have any questions, I can answer them. Otherwise, you just get out early, and nobody ever minds that. Do I think some of the advice I gave applies to writing software? Absolutely. And, um, and in fact, if we go back to my made-up statistic, about 80% of what we do is write text. In fact, uh, I tried to explain to my dad what I do once, and he said, so you're a typist? <laughs> He's not wrong. Right? But, um, but absolutely. I mean, if you're thinking, I think about um, text or content as the, the stuff I'm conveying in words, but also the stuff I'm conveying, which in some ways is the software, right? It's, it's what they see and how they use it. Uh, there was actually somebody else's, yeah. <laughs> Why all the goats? This is, you know, people ask me that. Um, uh, it's, OK, God, uh, I'm up on stage, but do we want to do all that? I'm going to over-explain is what is about to happen. Um, OK, so I'm staying at my rabbi's house, and she has a, the rabbi's wife has a metal goat outside called Sookie. One day, I'm walking by, and I'm like, hey, Sookie, how's it going? Because I talk to myself and inanimate objects. Now you know. And, and then I'm like, how's it goading, Sookie? And I <laughs> laughed all day long at my awesomeness. Um, <laughs> 
because <laughs> I'm a nerd. And I laughed all day. And I, from that, that was what inspired me to start liking goats, because I just amused myself so damn much by that. And so then, and it's like years later, and I am living two blocks from a farmer's market, and they advertised that goats were coming. Oh my goodness, this is exciting. And so this is my chance. I've never seen a goat you know, like that I could touch. And so I said, do you think your goats would mind if I hugged them? And they're like, we love, the goats would love you to hug them. And so then I am now the official goat hugger of JK uh, Goats in Damascus, Oregon. Um, and I am allowed to refer to those goats as my goats, which is fantastic. And, um, and I now hug goats on a regular basis. But I started liking goats, so then I joined Living Social. I'm talking about goats all the time, and there are goat puns happening. I'm bleeding it to death. Yes, that I just said that. Um, and I'm talking about that. And so somebody in the office drew a goat on the whiteboard. That was the office goat. And then Matt Robinson, who was our DevOps manager at the time, he said, you know, we should do something like cat user stories on Twitter, but with goats. And so the whole team sort of listed some goat user stories, lots of things about branches, as you can imagine. Goats <laughs> love branches. Um, and so, and, and in fact, we developed a Slack room for goat user stories, and the whole goal was like to overtake cat user stories, which is now just not even happening. But who would have thought we could have overtaken cat user stories on the internet with goats? But we did. So that was successful. And eventually, um, and it was a team effort with putting together the goat user stories for a long time. And then Matt kind of gave it up. It, for a while, it was me and Matt. And then um, Matt left, and he handed over the goat reins to me and um, gave me full, full ability to do that. And I'm sorry I over-explained that, but I'm on stage, and what the hell, you know? So <laughs> that's, I love goats. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> a any other questions? Oh my goodness, it's all syntax, right? It's a, uh, by the way, she's an English major and she wants to know how to encourage other people in the humanities to do coding. Well, first of all, the money, right? Am I right? Um, like, I was an assistant dean up at, the, up at Union Institute and University for a while in the PhD in humanities program, just so you know. I, I was the assistant dean, made half what I do now. I make more than the dean made uh, back then. Uh, it's so money for, for, for starters. <laughs> But honestly, it's, you're working with syntax, you're pattern matching, you're doing all the things that English majors do all the time. They're looking for patterns that they're, um, you know, everybody, you know, in high school, you have to look for the theme of the stupid literature that you're reading. You know, but we're doing that when we're building code. We're solving problems, we're using those critical thinking skills that, um, that we apply. And um, so honestly, I would just say they've already got the skills, and 80% of the job is typing, you know, it's, it's, it's writing words, so you're basically a writer, or a typist, you know, as my, I think my dad still thinks I'm a typist, which is okay, because he sends me money, and I'm like, okay, more money, I, that's not what I was in it for, but, uh, you know, I need more goat stickers, so, um, yeah, it actually hasn't made me real rich then, yes, <laughs> Why, yes, Betsy, who works at Rus Roostify, Roostify <laughs> is hiring, and, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> She's a ringer. Um, there is information on the stage right over here about Roostify and even a direct link to our jobs page, along with Roostify stickers and Goat User Story stickers right over there if you are interested. Thank you, Betsy, from Roostify. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for coming to a documentation talk. Who wants to come to one of those? <laughs>